Hello, my name is Avi and welcome to Maccabi Bushcraft. Here, we're going to be learning how to use a lensetic compass. So if you purchase a compass from us, or if you own a lensetic compass and you want to remember how to use it, join us in these seven lessons as we go through map skills, navigation skills, both day and night, as well as using the compass and knowing all of the elements and components of the compass. I'll see you around. Hello, my name is Avi and welcome to Maccabi Bushcraft. Here, we're going to be learning how to use a lensetic compass. So if you purchase a compass from us, or if you own a lensetic compass and you want to remember how to use it, join us in these seven lessons as we go through map skills, navigation skills, both day and night, as well as using the compass and knowing all of the elements and components of the compass. I'll see you around. Welcome back to lesson number two, the grid. In this lesson, we're going to be learning these specific learning objectives. Number one, understand how to read grid coordinates. Number two, understand what a four digit and six digit coordinate are. Number three, understanding the difference between magnetic north, true north, and grid north. Number four, understanding an azimuth. Number five, understanding terrain features. Number six, understanding the difference between magnetic azimuth and grid azimuth. Number seven, understanding how to plot a grid azimuth and know how to convert it to magnetic azimuth. And lastly, number eight, understanding how to plot a magnetic azimuth. Okay, so in the last lesson, we learned about how to understand the basics of a compass, and we also learned about the basics of how to read a map. And the last thing we learned was we learned how to actually take our compass and read it so that it's directly in line with grid north. So now that we have this issue learned, let's add more to our understanding. Here we're going to be focusing upon the importance of finding coordinates on a map. And in order to do so, we have to go over some basics of remembering. First, we're going to have to look at the fact that we have to remember that on the bottom of our page, as well as what we will see on the top, these numbers represent the longitude. That is, from the number itself that we see where the line it's located on, from that point all the way to the right is going to represent 709. That means 709 kilometers away from the actual beginning of our actual grid of S10. Or as we can say, 209 kilometers away from the central meridian of the actual place of S10. And that's the actual UTM zone that we're referring to, which is what this map is in relationship to. So now that, that we understand this part, we always have to remember 709, as we see here, represents longitude. This we're going to indicate as the blue line. That means from this point all the way to this point, 
this is what we're going to be looking at longitude wise when actually going to plot or seek out the understanding of a grid point. The next we have to look at is the next number which is 4250. 4250 is our latitude lines. That means that this point here is 4250 kilometers away from the actual equator. And any number that we see that's on the either right or left hand side of the page is going to represent to me that these are the latitude lines that we're going to be looking at, which is going to be represented here for the second, which is the red line. That means from the point of the bottom all the way up to the top of that where that red line meets, this segment is what I'm going to be looking at in relationship to latitude lines, the latitude segment, okay? And that basically means I'm going to be looking at a point that represents like this. I'm going to be seeing that A, I have my 709, which is my longitude. I have the line that represents the longitude segment. I have the 4,250 line, which is represented by my red segment. And that means this grid, as is highlighted here, is the grid I'm going to be looking at in order to plot or as in order to understand where I am going to be looking on the map a specific grid point. And this is what we have to understand about this, which is vitally important. Number one, we have to understand that this grid square equals one kilometer or 0.621 miles. Since we're going to be utilizing kilometers and meters, I just threw out the 0.621 miles. Just to kind of give you an idea if you're not used to using metric system of measurement. So remember this specifically one kilometer all in distance or it equals 1,000 meters or once again 3,280 feet. That's a whole square distance that we are looking at here when we're trying to understand the representation of this in relationship to the map. So let's understand something that we need to know here about this distance and about what we're doing with regard to this map. When utilizing the reading of a map in order to find the actual location of our position and which we have plotted, we will have to be utilizing a protractor. The protractor is going to be used in order to take each of the grid squares and look within the grid squares what our actual location is. And based upon our location, we only have two quadrant numbers that we have to understand. The first one is 09. Remember, 709 was the 709 kilometers away from the actual beginning of our S10 grid, whereas 4,250 kilometers was the distance that showed us how up in elevation we are from the actual equator. Since we're going to be utilizing quadrant system, to simplify things, we're only going to be using the last two numbers. Every single digit always has to have a zero in front of it. That's why we're going to see 709. We're just going to see 09 as the quadrant number. And 4250, we're only going to use the 50 because of the fact that it simplifies our utilizing this when reading the map. So here we're looking at 09. 50. This equates this whole grid that we're looking at right here. Each grid in this actual protractor as we're looking at it has separate little grid boxes inside. Each of these grid boxes represents a hundred meters in distance. You're going to utilize these hundred meters in distance with maps such as 1 by 15,000, 1 by 20,000, 1 by 24,000, 1 by 25,000, and 1 by 30,000. There also is smaller lines which are not visible in this actual protractor, but I've made them semi-visible by creating a smaller dash at the bottom of the actual grid. These little dashes represent the 50 meter mark. And there's an even a smaller dash that is actually used, which represents 10 meters. So if you think about it, between 9 and 10 is a total of 100 meters. So let's go and let's break this down very simple. What is a four-digit grid? 
a four digit grid is utilizing the longitude and the latitude number in order to get a grid box. So here in this very thing, we're using 709 or basically 09 as our longitude line and 4250 or 50 as our latitude line, which creates this grid box. This here is a four digit grid and it will read as such 0950. That is a four digit. In order to get a six digit grid, we're going to have to go within those small grid boxes we just talked about. And in doing so, we're going to have to be utilizing the protractor to pinpoint a position so that we can see where we are going to be at within at least a hundred meters of variance. That's going to give us a six digit grid. To get even more precise, we could go into an eight digit grid, but we will learn that at a very much later time. Here, we're only going to focus on learning how to do a six digit grid. So in order to do a six digit grid, that means we're going to be placing ourselves somewhere within the actual grid box we're looking at. So let's think about this. How would we do this? We need to first understand things about terrain features in order to really understand how we are going to find ourselves or where is it we're going to be locating or where is it direction wise or location wise we want to go according to the map. And in order to have this understanding of how to utilize the map, I have to understand terrain features. Terrain features are vitally important and basically there are 10 terrain features we need to focus on. What is a hill? A hill is basically, as we're going to see in this picture, is a very non-steep slope, gradual movement of land mass. And a hill, as opposed to a mountain, there are many different arguments as to relationship to it. Some say that the fact that a mountain is anything 2,000 feet and above, and a hill is defined as anything 2,000 feet and below. And in order to get away from this kind of concept of understanding, we're going to look at hills and mountains based upon the understanding of this. Hills are going to be defined as a slow grade of upward movement. That's why when we look at number one, we're looking at a gradual grade that's moving up to a peak. And this is what we're going to define as a hill, not a, not a quick going upward to a peak, but a slow gradual move up to a peak. Here in this diagram, as we look at number one, we would have to see that the circle surrounding number one would indicate the fact that this would take obviously a lot of feet before the actual change of elevation would increase. So therefore we're going to define this as a hill. Okay. Number two, a valley. A valley is basically a flat area that is existing on the map where there is no elevation terrain that's located in it. That is what we're going to be understanding when we're looking at the terrain features. Number three, we're going to look at a ridge. A ridge is, as we see, is the pointing aspects of the actual mountainside or hillside that is moving away from the hill to create these slopes that move downward from the top to the bottom of the hill and they come at different points of the actual mountain or hillside. A saddle is indicated as we look at number four it shows us this is the difference between two peaks and the sloping position of these two peaks inside of it we call the saddle. Number five is a depression. And as we see, a depression is when landmass has been pressed downward, and we see the fact that there is basically an encavement inside the landmass itself. Number six is a draw. So what is a draw? A draw is where we see when we see that a large amount of landmass is moving to a point and goes, in a sense, vertically upward in many different sharp degrees as elevation changes. The next part we're going to look at is a spur. What are spurs? Spurs are outward landmass areas that press outward 
from an area that we see located next to number one, the hilltop, which we see the spur is that land mass that just moves outward and drops and stays. And then of course, you would go to the point where we'd have flat land at that point. So that's that last portion of the hill that comes to the flat area of the land. And number eight, we have a cliff. A cliff is basically a straight drop off that we see a very sharp incline of elevation that does nothing but drops off to an actual flat point going straight downward. Number nine is a cut. So if you look at this, a cut we have to see in this picture here is going to be defined as an area that has been cut. And this part of the map we see here shows us that part of the land has been cut into by which this was done by um, large machinery moving dirt out of the way that it takes away from the actual natural land features itself. And of course, number 10 is the field. This is where we're going to see, once again, these two are going to be basically man-made things that we're going to see, where land mass has been pushed to an area in order to lift up an area. And this is what we're looking for as we see these different pictures and these different diagrams on a map. When I understand my terrain features, it gives me a strong ability to understand immediately what it is I need to be looking for when in relationship to the map. Because when I want to find out where I am, if I know I'm on this area, and I know the features in the terrain area very well, I can identify by looking at where I'm at physically and associate it with the map after I position my compass to be appointed to grid north and I associate the position of landmass and the direction that I should be looking in, I can immediately identify the area that I'm surrounded by and the features that are next to me. This may not be the same case in every scenario. In most common scenarios that are dealing with hillsides or mountain range areas, flatlands are going to be the hardest as well as deserts in relationship to this, but we'll talk about that stuff later. So let's talk about four digit, six digit, and eight digit coordinates. We're not going to go into detail with eight digit, but we'll, we'll definitely talk about it and give us some understanding of it and how it works. So that at least you have an understanding that there is a higher level of utilizing coordinates and how to actually pinpoint things a lot more detailed. When we're talking about a four digit coordinates, we're talking only about the fact that this is going to tell me that this box is where I'm going to be looking at something, whether it's a land feature, whether it's a specific location, or whether it's a specific uh, area that I want to camp at. But I don't have a specific place within this box that I'm going to be pinpointing at. And that's because this is only a four digit coordinate. That means I'm only covering one kilometer by one kilometer or 1000 meters by 1000 meters of just looking space. When we want to talk about a specific location within that actual four digit grid, we're now going to make a six digit grid to make that location specific. The only thing about this is wherever you pinpoint the place that you want to be, you're only going to be within at least a hundred meters of proximity to the actual location, not the actual location itself. So that is something you have to understand that when you're using six digit coordinates, you're talking about a hundred meters proximity to the location. When you use an eight digit coordinate box, you're talking about an actual 10 meter distance of proximity, which gives you a lot more closer ability to get to the location that you're looking at as opposed to a hundred meters. So in order to understand a six digit grid, we have to understand some things about what things we're going to be utilized to make this. This is where our basic protractor is going to come into play. I want to show you what a protractor looks like first, so we can kind of get an idea of what we're going to be doing. This protractor, as you see on the screen, represents the actual square of a one kilometer by one kilometer or a 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters square distance. As you can see on both the bottom and the right hand side, 
Each of the larger numbers represents a hundred meters in distance. The smaller numbers represent 10 meters in distance. When you use a protractor, when you're going and putting this upon the map, if you're going to be using a six-digit coordinate reading, you will be using the larger numbers as is seen here. Whereas the smaller numbers you'd be utilizing in order for you to read an eight-digit grid. That's why, as you see in the blow-up, the digits that are smaller also cover a smaller amount of grid. That smaller grid represents the 10 meters in distance, as I spoke to you earlier. Where the large grids that we see here only represents each as a hundred meters in distance per grid square. And so when we're talking about how we are to read, the, the way we're going to be reading the protractor is always going to be using the coordinates that we get first, which represents the longitude. That means you're always going to be reading from right to up. So that means we're always going to do longitude first before we do the latitude. The latitude will always be the last number that we're going to be speaking about. So when we're talking about a six digit grid, the first number, as we saw on the map, is going to be that, 0, 9. When reading any four digit, we have to remember that the first two digits, which are on a four digit grid, is always going to tell me what grid box we're looking at. No matter if the number is a single digit, it will always be read as a double digit. So if it's a two, it's a four, it's a five, it's going to be 0, 2, 0, 4, 0, 5. Here, the longitude is 0, 9. Now that we have 0, 9, we want to look for this little dot that we see on our page here. This dot represents the fact that this dot is some kind of thing that we want to find that's in a position that's located within these grids. This is going to be a simple way of looking at how to utilize a protractor before we throw it on a map. Here when we look at this thing, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting from left to right and we're going to be reading the boxes from left to right as to what box is located in that column where that dot is. So we're going to be going one, two, three, four, five. That gives me the longitude. That means I'm going to put in the longitude the number five. So now it's going to be zero, nine, five. Now we're going to be reading the latitude. Since the latitude begins with 50, because that's the latitude line that we're on, we now are going to count from 50, and we're going to be counting the lines going upward. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So now the number is 5 for my latitude. So my six-digit coordinate is going to be 0, 9, 5, 5, 0, 5, and this is my six-digit coordinate. I hope you understand how quickly and easy this is to understand and navigate around as to know how to use a protractor. There are different types of protractors out there, and I'm going to be showing you one of them that functions a little different as opposed to the one that you see before you. This one actually simplifies it and uses a more simple way instead of having to count the lines, all you got to do is take your protractor and move it over. And I'll show you exactly how this is going to be done. So let's look at how this new protractor works. Basically this protractor is a little different in the fact that the numbers don't go from 1 to 10, it goes from 10 to 1. And I'll talk about why this is so. On the right hand side, which is the latitude, we're going to be seeing this in a more highlighted version, but this area would be open for you to put your pencil mark or your pen mark when you go to use the protractor. And in order to understand the protractor, let's go back and think. Remember this line that I talked about, which we're going to be utilizing with regard to the protractor, so that we're going to be basically taking the pinpoint that we have, which is the mark area we're going to be looking at, such as here, and we're going to be moving our protractor over where the highlighted area is actually over the area that our pinpoint marker is in order to say where is the location of this place. In this place, we're going to see the fact that the location of the longitude is 084, latitude 506. 
Now, if I wanted to use an eight digit code, all I'd have to do is look at the smaller numbers that are written, and I would take the smaller numbers and add it to my longitude and latitude, and now I'd have an eight digit grid, which would therefore give me a 10 meter distance as opposed to a 100 meter distance of a proximity to my location. And this is why, in some cases, if you can, if it is possible, eight digits are perfect, but it's not necessary and, and get by well. So this is something that we want to understand is to understand the difference between one protractor and another one. Okay, so we talked about how to understand a four digit, six digit, and eight digit. We also talked about how to utilize a protractor with regard to a map. Now let's talk about what is true north. True north is a line from any point on the Earth's surface to the North Pole. This can be found in two manners. One, in the day, using shadows, which we will cover, and the other, in the evening, using the North Star. This, when found on a map, is always represented with a star above it on the declination diagram. True North is almost exclusively sought after when one is navigating without a compass and in the evening. So let's understand the fact that if you're going to be navigating without a compass in the evening, in order to find True North, you're going to be utilizing the North Star to do this. We will cover this in nighttime navigation. The next thing we have to understand is what is Magnetic North. Magnetic North is the magnetic field which pulls toward the north, but is not exactly at the North Pole. And this is why we're using the compass, we're going to be only utilizing what's called Magnetic North. But when we're utilizing a map, we're using what's called Grid North. That is, the lines that are going vertical up and down is the direction found on the grid, which is used as the lateral or the vertical lines as found on a map. So therefore, grid north is always gonna be the vertical or up and down lines that we find on a map. Okay, now let's cover what an azimuth is and what different types of azimuths there are. An azimuth is the degree or angle used to create the direction one is seeking to travel using either a compass or a line plotted on a map. A grid azimuth is the degree or angle plotted on a map used to create the direction one is seeking to travel. Whereas a magnetic azimuth is the degree or angle created by using a compass used to create the direction one is seeking to travel. So basically, when we're trying to talk about creating an azimuth, we're talking about the simplicity of basically saying, I'm gonna be taking this degree that's gonna be shown on the compass and that degree is going to tell me a direction. And that direction is where I'm facing. And based upon that degree, if I keep my compass on that degree point and I travel in that direction, I should be heading in the direction I am facing and I should be going towards the actual place to which I am seeking to travel to. When I want to travel utilizing a grid, I'm going to be plotting my actual azimuth using a different method using a grid azimuth as opposed to a magnetic azimuth. When I'm using a grid azimuth, I'm going to have I'm going to have to add what's called the grid north angle, and that's the GM angle. The GM angle is going to be the angle I have to use added to my compass in order to compensate the difference between magnetic and grid. And so when I'm utilizing a grid azimuth, I have to convert my actual compass to read grid north, then I'll be plotting all of my different angles, which I'm going to be utilizing. I'll be plotting my different points on a map. But when I go to actually physically go to the location, I'm going to have to go from grid to magnetic. So that means I'm going to have to add the actual angle onto my magnetic uh, compass in order for it to go in the same direction as the grid plot was set. And this is how we're going to do it. So watch and let's get an idea of how this is going to be done. So let's focus about making a grid azimuth before we get into learning about how to make a magnetic azimuth. The purpose of which we would make a grid azimuth is when we want to plot a point from our map based upon a known point to another point in order to calculate both the distance as well as direction. So in order to do so, we will need to go back to our map again to plot this. 
Now let's take these two points as is found on our map and draw a line long enough so that the points are connected and so that the protractor degrees can be read on both ends of the protractor. This will give us our grid azimuth for directions. Here we have two points plotted, 248 degrees and 68 degrees. If walking from point A to point B, our bearing would be 248 degrees. If walking from point B back to point A, we would have to use 68 degrees for our grid azimuth. However, this has to be converted over into magnetic azimuth in order to arrive to our destination through the use of our compass when traveling. Which means we need to know the declination degree or the GMA angle. To convert this information over correctly so we can use our compass to begin our journey, to do this, remember the rule. If the magnetic angle is to the right of the declination, turn the bezel right. If to the left, turn the bezel left and count the clicks. Remember, each click represents three clicks per click. So if our declination says 15 degrees and our magnetic angle is to the right of the declination, turn the bezel ring five clicks and add 15 degrees to 248 degrees. So it reads now 258 degrees. If the magnetic angle is to the left of the declination, turn the bezel ring to the left, click and subtract 15 degrees from 248 degrees. So it reads 233 degrees on your compass. Now, to convert our back azimuth of 68 degrees, we simply apply the same rule as if our declination reads 15 degrees and the magnetic angle is at the right of the declination. Turn the bezel ring five clicks, add 15 degrees to 68 degrees, so it reads 83 degrees. If the magnetic angle is to the left of the declination, turn the bezel ring to the left, five clicks, subtract 15 degrees to 68 degrees, so it's 53 degrees. You just learn how to plot an azimuth on a map as well as learning how to return back to your original position by using what's called a back azimuth. Now let's learn how to plot a magnetic azimuth as opposed to using a map for direction and land layout when using a map. A compass on the other hand requires the use of visual markers. This is done through the use of sight wire on the compass while we align the compass facing the direction of choice using land features which are visible as a means to mark visibly where it is we're seeking to travel. When doing this, it's obvious that the distance might be unknown to us. However, since we are using a compass, the degree or angle will be our source of absolute information. Note, we'll be covering making magnetic azimuth in the evening later. And also, we will also cover how to determine an unknown distance in a later video as well. Because we're using a magnetic compass, we have to keep in mind metal and electrical things. We want to keep away from our compass so as it doesn't interfere with our reading. So here's some rules of thumb to utilize. If you have high tension wires or power lines, be at least 55 meters away in distance from these things. Vehicles, be at least 10 meters away. Large portable metal objects, two meters. So you want to keep things of object, obviously metal, away from your compass because this can interfere with your compass reading and we don't want that to happen. So, how to hold a compass? Let's learn how to hold a compass. Open the cover all the way till it's tilted flat. Move the sight to the rear as far as possible so that the dial moves freely. Place your thumb through the loop and form a stead base with your third and fourth finger and, and extend both index fingers along the side of the compass. Place the thumb on the other hand between the lens and the bezel ring and place the remaining fingers around the fingers of the other hand. Pull your elbow firmly into your sides to turn your entire body until you reach your desired point of reference and the black magnetic azimuth is under the fixed black index line. Now, if you want to utilize the cheat technique, this is how you have to do it. Open the compass so that the cover is vertical, formed about a 90 degree angle with the base. Move the rear sight to the rear most position to release the dial, then fold it slightly forward. Turn the thumb loop all the way down, insert your thumb, form a loose fist under the compass, steady it with your hand, raise it to your eye level.
look through the rear sight notch and center the front sight wire in the rear sight notch. Keeping the compass level and the sight aligned, rotate your entire body until the sight wire is lined up with your designated object. Glance down through the lens, read the degree which is directly under the black index line, and the azimuth you read is the magnetic azimuth from your position to the direct object. Once you've done the above, you will know your degrees of angle, and you can now move toward your object. Just keep your degree under the black index line and continue heading to that direction till you have arrived. If you need to keep looking at your compass to make sure that the correct reading is under the index line, do so because you want to make sure you're on track and continue heading in that direction. You now know how to make a magnetic azimuth. We'll see you next time in lesson number three, the pace count.